back in Exodus chapter 3. I'm going to start reading in verse number 1. It says, Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Now, let's pause for just a minute and get our bearings again, okay? Um, so, uh, Moses was born to a Hebrew family who had been enslaved with Israel to the Egyptians. And his birth would have been uh, a pretty stressful time because this Pharaoh had given the command that all Hebrew male children should be killed. They should be cast into the Nile, disposed of in some way. It, but Moses' parents... Rather than fearing Pharaoh, they believed the promises of God and they put baby Moses into his own little personal ark and they put him out on the river where he was discovered by none other than Pharaoh's daughter. And so Pharaoh's daughter adopts Moses and brings him into her own home. And Moses grows up with all of the benefits of Egyptian royalty. But there comes a time at age 40 where Moses decides that he must go out and identify with God's people. And so by faith, he leaves the, the royalty and he steps into a relationship with the slaves but things do not go according to plan. Moses had this idea that I'm going to step in, I'm going to be the Savior. I'm going to be the Redeemer. I'm going to be the Rescuer here. Look at what God has done. Look at my experience and my time in Pharaoh's household. It only makes sense, right? And besides that, the 400 years are nearing its conclusion. So let's go do this thing, right? Moses decides that he's going to be the one, but his plan um, didn't go over so well. He ends up killing an Egyptian taskmaster, and rather than leading a revolt of the Israelites against their oppressors, the Israelites step back and were like, <laughs> you're on your own. They, the, the Egyptians come by to investigate the crime, and they're like, it wasn't us, right? It was this, this guy Moses. Uh, we know this, and yes, we are throwing him under the bus. So Moses ends up a man without a country. He is, he's rejected by his own um, tribe, his own people, and he's rejected by his adopted people because now Pharaoh is seeking to kill him, and so he flees into the wilderness. And while he's there, we saw last week his instincts for justice kick in again, and he rescues a, a group of women, daughters of a priest, a local priest. He rescues them from this band of shepherds that were bullying and, and, and oppressing and stealing and whatever was going on there. Moses stands up for them and he delivers them. These lady's father is like, hey, I know a good thing when I see it. Brings Moses into his house. Has his oldest daughter married to Moses. So Moses now has a wife, Zipporah. And he has a son named Gershom, which means literally a stranger there or a sojourner there. It's always fascinating how names in ancient times work. They're always kind of a painting a picture for us. Moses is like, I'm a sojourner. I don't belong here. I'm a stranger. So what are you going to name your son? Stranger things, right? He's a stranger fella. So verse number one represents another time warp. We learned this from Stephen in Acts chapter 7 that Moses was in Midian for 40 years. And it would seem like that the plans of God in that 40 years have been lost. Or at least fundamentally in some way altered by Moses' failure. Because certainly, though God had maybe chosen Moses, and maybe even some way identified to Moses that he would be the deliverer, certainly after Moses' magnificent failure, and 40 years of exile, certainly God's plans have changed. But folks, Moses didn't realize, and I'm not sure that we often realize, that God never has to resort to plan B. It's part of what it means to be 
and to have absolute sovereignty. And so as we pick up the story in verse number 1, Moses makes his way to the west side of the wilderness in search of pasture land for his father-in-law's flock. And he comes unexpectedly to the mountain of God. Now, I say it's unexpected because Moses didn't know where he was or didn't know that he was lost, but because it's almost certain that this mountain, which was known as Horeb, which means dry or desert, it's almost certain that this mountain was not known as the mountain of God until after the events that are about to unfold here with Moses and later on the events that are going to unfold between God and Israel at this same mountain. So it's as if Moses is taking a future name of this mountain and he's bringing it into the storyline here to kind of foreshadow what is coming. So at the end of chapter 2, we saw God on the move, right? Like all of a sudden, this God has been behind the scenes. It's God who sees and hears and knows and remembers. And you get this, this idea that God is stirring. God is about to do something after 400 years. And now Moses is like, yeah, if you got that impression at the end of chapter 2, you're right on target because I'm coming now to the mountain of God. That's what it's going to be. He's given us a clue. So in verse number two, and again, just before we read the rest of this, there are a number of surprising things that happen in this chapter. And I want to say that at the outset because I think sometimes, particularly if you've been in church for a long time, maybe you grew up, you saw these Sunday school lessons, uh, you know, you had the flannel graph. Um, Some of you don't even know what flannel graph is. It dawns on me. Some of you have never had the experience of like the rug on the wall that you slap the pictures on and they stick and it's like, oh yeah, right? Like there's Joseph in the pit and uh, you know, whatever, Moses in the fiery bush. But we get so used to the stories that sometimes we, they lose their surprising element to us. But this story in a number of ways is, is surprising, it is shocking. So I want you to be on the lookout for that on the lookout for that as we read through, starting in verse number 2. It says, And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings. And I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppress them. Come. I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. All right? Surprising things. Okay? Right off the bat, there is a surprise because there is a bush that is on fire. And listen, I read a couple of, you know, commentaries and researching, and, and there were several people that were like, you know, in a hot and dry, arid climate like that, it probably wasn't all that unusual to see a bush on fire. I, I don't know. Like, I understand, like, the science that you're trying to, to get at there, but I'm not sure even in deserts if bushes are just spontaneously combusting into flames, okay? And even if it did, I can't imagine it's all that common. Uh, granted, I'm not an expert. I watch the Discovery Channel occasionally, and there's never been uh, a documentary on spontaneously combusting bushes in the desert. And I would think that if this was a fairly regular occurrence, that would be out there. Now, Again, maybe, all right? Like maybe I could see an electrical storm, lightning strikes. We get that here in Florida, right? And if it's dry and arid, maybe something catches fire, okay? I I grant you that. I'm just not sure that this would not also be something surprising. If I'm walking through the desert, 
and a bush is on fire, it's going to get my attention, okay? And it got Moses' attention. But what's more shocking than a bush that is on fire is a bush that is on fire that's not burned up. Right? Again, science, okay? You light wood on fire, the wood goes away, okay? And when it's a dry, brambly bush, it doesn't take that long. This is not like a log, okay, that you're throwing on a fire and it's going to burn for an hour and you're going to sit around and enjoy it. We, we like to, we, we have a, a fire pit of sorts out back, and we used to, back when we were um, really uh, festive and, and enjoyed Christmas because we bought a real Christmas tree, um, and now we don't. We have a fake one, and so we're, we're kind of in that Scrooge category now. Um, but we used to, I'm kidding, I love our fake tree. It's amazing, and it doesn't shed needles everywhere. Uh, but, but we would get the, the real tree uh, to celebrate real Christmas with. Um, and then when the season was over and the tree was all dried up, we would take it into the backyard and we would cut it into pieces because we're not crazy people, but we would cut it and break the limbs off. And, and there's nothing more satisfying than taking parts of that tree and throwing it into the fire because what happens? You ever done this? Right, you get the needle parts, or I don't know, like the, the sap and, and whatever's in there, and it just, poof, it, it's, it's this magnificent display of, you know, potentially fiery death, but it's amazing. But then it's gone as quickly as you light it. It's burned out, and there's nothing left. Why? Because it is a dry, nothing, it's nothing more than a brambly bush at this point. It's just branches and they're consumed in a moment. And yet Moses says, I'm going to go see this bush and and try to figure out why it's on fire but not eaten up, which is the language that the Hebrews use to describe what fire does to wood. It eats it. This fire is not being eaten. So Moses decides to to go visit. (laughs) distracted for just a moment by the conversation we had on Thursday night in the life group because someone was like, why would Moses actually say this out loud? I mean, there's no one else around. It's just sheep. Like, why would he be like, I'm going to go and turn aside and go see this amazing sight. You sheep hang out here. I'll be right back. Uh, I don't know. He's been in the desert by himself for a long time. He hangs out with sheep. He probably talks to himself. Um, maybe, though, it was an internal monologue that Moses is giving for our benefit Either way. But he goes to see this bush. Now, interestingly enough, Moses uses a word for bush here, and the Hebrew word is senna, right? Which is a fairly uncommon word in the Hebrew language for bush. It literally means bramble, something like a thorn bush. And I think he uses this for a couple of reasons. One is because the word senna sounds an awful lot like the name that this mountain is going to come to be known by, Sinai. So I think he's planting here this little verbal clue, again, of where we're going in this story. We'll come back to the idea of the bush in just a second, and, and why, uh, why also I think it's important to understand uh, why Moses was making a big deal about this thing. Um, but this fire is, is a visible manifestation, we're told, of the angel of the Lord. Now, when you read the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord makes regular appearances, and, and we're not 100% certain what this is there's a few different options here is it you know people have postulated that maybe it is a pre-carnate visible representation of christ the second person of the godhead Uh, some people have postulated that it is simply god himself the father taking a form that is in some way visible to men maybe it is just an angel standing in for god um, and people have kind of uh, discussed back and forth, well, sometimes the angel of the Lord receives worship um, and, and must be obeyed, and like it says, it's the voice of God. But I, I don't think reading through the Old Testament, I've kind of come full circle on this. I used to be like, this is absolutely God come in some visible representation. I'm not 100% sure of that anymore because I think there are clear instances in the Old Testament where angelic beings are, are spoken of almost in tandem with the voice of God and the worship that God is receiving. Uh, we see this on Mount Sinai later with Israel. It's like God is the one who's coming to visit with Moses and deliver the law to Moses. But in the New Testament, we're told it was delivered by angels. Right? So, so what exactly is going on? It, it almost appears as if God is in some way able to uh, use an, an angelic presence um, 
to, to uh, manifest to mankind at some point. But we're just not clear exactly what it means that the angel of the Lord is there other than it is the presence of God very clearly. We know that, and we're going to see why in just a minute, because it is a voice, and it is a holy presence, okay? God is here meeting with Moses. Let's come back to the bush for a second. Why a burning bush? Why, of all of the things that God could have chosen, why a bush? Well, I think that in some way, using this bush, this bramble, this senna, was telling us something about God's plan. It was, in its own way, a reminder of where the story is going. Because I see in this picture images of Eden. Okay, so you picture, we've got Moses now on a mountaintop with the presence of God, and we have a flame of fire and an angelic presence. What happens in Eden? Eden was the place where God would meet with man. It was a mountaintop. It was a place where God dwelled. It was holy. And when he cast out Adam and Eve, he says to Adam, you are no longer just going to work the ground and things aren't just going to sprout up. There's going to be thorns and thistles and you're going to fight against the ground. I'm sending you into a land of bramble. Thorns thistles and to make sure that you do not enter back into this garden I'm going to put a flaming fiery sword and an angelic presence right to ensure that no one can enter into this holy place again because it is a danger for us to enter into the holiness of God so we, we have this imagery, and it's almost as if God is through the picture of a burning bush and the angelic presence of God. It's almost as if he's reminding us that the purpose of Exodus is to reverse the problem of Genesis, the problem of exile away from the presence of God. Because rather than God casting Moses off of the holy ground and away from God's presence, he invites him in. In spite of all that has happened, in spite of all the failures and all the sins, in spite of Moses being in the wilderness for 40 years, the plan hasn't changed. God is going to make a way to rescue slaves and make them sons. The bush tells us something about God's plan. It also tells us something about God's character, I think. We talked about earlier about having a fire pit and bonfire. It's something we enjoy doing like the three weeks out of the year when it's cool down here and you can actually enjoy it. Uh, if you've ever tried it when it's not that cool, you're sitting like 20 feet from the fire and it doesn't quite have the same effect. But when it is a little cooler at night and you light the fire and you go out at nighttime and, and, and fires uh, are, are really um, inviting, aren't they? They're really relaxing, and they make magnificent hot dogs. And, and so as a family, we like sitting around the fire, and we enjoy the presence and the blessing of that fire. Its light is mesmerizing. Its warmth is inviting. There's something about fire that relaxes and calms, doesn't it? Now, nothing makes you sleepy faster than sitting around a fire at nighttime. But there's something else about fire. Fire has another side. Fire is also dangerous. You remember that, by the way, when you have a, a fire and young children present who want nothing more than to play with the fire and light things on fire and run around them with flaming sticks. You just, you know, some of the relaxing atmosphere tends to dissipate. Why? Because there is a danger in the fire. It is both calming and relaxing and inviting and very dangerous. And perhaps that's why God chose a fire to represent himself to Moses because he himself invites people into his presence, but he is dangerous. We know instinctively, 
in the presence of a holy God that we do not belong there. Coming too close is dangerous for us. Well, there's another surprise. This bush that will not be eaten by fire speaks. A voice comes from the bush. And listen, again, I, there, there's a surprising element um, to a number of places in Scripture. There, there are several places where it's like, it's so surprising and so shocking that I have a hard time um, identifying with what's going on. Because I could, I could see myself in the desert going, man, there's a bush and it's not being burned up. That's really unusual. I'm curious. I'm going to check that out. But the minute I stepped up to that bush and it spoke to me, I'm done, okay? I got nothing else to say to bushes that are on fire. Maybe this is, I can't ever wonder, maybe there's some supernatural, like God is doing something here to compel Moses. There's some irresistible grace in God's voice that holds Moses there. But there, there are other stories like this in the Bible, right? Like, you can just go research on your own. You remember the whole thing between Eve and the serpent? I'm not there, okay? I'm not talking to snakes uh, or Balaam and his donkey. I have a hard time relating to those stories. And yet there's a voice that comes out of this bush that must have been shocking in some way, must have been surprising in some way, yet Moses stays. He doesn't flee. He doesn't run away. And everything this voice says tells us something that I think is surprising about the God who is speaking to Moses. What's the first thing he says? If you look back, he says, Moses, Moses, and Moses says, here am I. Then he said, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. The first thing it tells us is exactly the, what, what the picture of fire I think was trying to tell us. There is a danger to the presence of this God. He is holy, and we are not. This is the first time in Scripture, this is part of the reason you say, well, that's not all that surprising. Like, we've heard that all forever. But this is the first time, if you're reading through the Bible chronologically, this is the first time in Scripture that I could find where God is referred to in some way as being holy. And at this point in Moses' life, in his journey, with God about to call him to do this thing again, he's saying, Moses, the first thing you need to know about me is I am holy. I am not like you. I am not like you. This is teaching Moses a couple of things. One is, hey, you're going to go and you're going to rescue these people from Egypt. I'm going to do it through you. But you in Israel need to know that my presence with you is a dangerous thing. You need an appropriate level of fear and respect when it comes to a holy God. They also needed to know that this God who was going with them is holy because the holy God is a terror to those who oppose him. He is, as the writer of Hebrews says, a consuming fire. What kind of God? could rescue a people from the power of Egypt. It is a holy God. But you also need to know this holy God can make a way and is willing to make a way for the unholy to dwell safely in his presence. And so he says, Moses, stop where you are. Don't come any closer. Take off your sandals, which I think was a sign of of respect. It was a sign of, Moses, you were in the presence of someone greater than you. But Moses was permitted to stay. There was a limitation on the closeness. There was a representation uh, of Moses, of his subordinates to this holy God. But there is inherent in this conversation, in the fact that it is the presence of God, and it is heaven in some way touching down on earth, and yet Moses is permitted in his presence that I think gives both Moses and Israel and us the hope that a holy God will make a way. The holy God will make a way. We don't belong in his presence.
This opens the door for the Passover that's going to happen later in Exodus. Where God is going to make a way for His people to be saved from the angel as it passes over. And they're going to do so through sacrifice and blood. Which ultimately opens the door to Jesus who would become our Passover lamb who in the process of shedding His blood would snuff out the consuming wrath of God by becoming our sacrifice. This is what we are told in 1 John 4. Verse number 10, he says, In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sin. Propitiation is just a big fancy word for He snuffed it out. He satisfied the demands of a holy and righteous God toward us. God is holy. The second thing that this voice says to Moses is that God is not late. He is not late. And that's surprising to us because there are times in our lives where we wonder, right? We're like, where, where are you, God, and how long, O oh Lord, and this timing of yours isn't very comfortable, and I'm ready at any moment now, right? Like, time feels like it's going really short, and I don't have any answers, and my anxiety level is rising, and this voice wants to say to Moses, Moses, you've been in the, in the wilderness for 40 years, but God is never late. Where do we see that? Verse number four, it says, God called to Moses out of the bush, Moses, Moses. Moses says, here I am. And then we get this instruction to Moses about keeping his distance and taking his shoes off. And then the Lord says, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and Jacob. Now, when, when Moses says, here I am, that's a fairly common response in Hebrew. It's kind of like if, you know, if, if I were to walk up to you uh, later and be like, um, you know, hey, George. George. And all of a sudden, George hears. There's no way I'm going to put George here even, is there? Uh, and, but George, George finally hears and recognizes I'm talking to him. He's like, he's like, oh, yeah. Oh, hey. Right? That's kind of our way of saying, you got my attention, I'm listening, right? To the Hebrew, here I am, it's kind of like, you got my attention, I'm listening, okay? But, but there are times in Scripture where, that, that I think fire off in our memories, if you're familiar with your Bibles, where, where we know of people who responded to God in just this very way. It's a, it's a fairly common phrase for people to use when God is calling them. We saw this with Abraham in Genesis chapter 22, verse number 7. God calls, and Abraham says, here I am, Lord. Isaiah chapter 6, that we just read. Isaiah has this vision of God, and it goes through this repentance, and God cleanses him, and then God's like, I need someone to go, and Isaiah says, here I am. Send me. We see it in Acts chapter 6 with Ananias. God comes to him and is, like, and, and is going to tell him, I want you to go find Saul and bring him in. And he comes to Ananias, and Ananias says, here I am. But the one that is striking in, in similarity to what we see here with Moses is Genesis chapter 46. In Genesis chapter 46, uh, Jacob has learned now that his son Joseph is alive and in Egypt, and Joseph has invited Jacob and his entire family to come to Egypt to escape the famine. And Jacob was maybe a little uncertain because God had promised him and I think Jacob was going right like he's going to go see Joseph and in the back of Jacob's mind maybe was this this wondering like I know God has promised to my father and to his father before him and to me that this land that we're in right now this is going to be our land and we're going to leave it what about the promise of God so God comes to Jacob in Genesis 46 verse number two and it says and God spoke to Israel Jacob in visions of the night and said Jacob Jacob all right, Moses, Moses, Jacob, Jacob. Then Jacob says, here I am. And then God says, I am God, the God of your fathers. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for there I will make you into a great nation. I myself will go down with you to Egypt, and I will also bring you up again. That was the promise of God to Jacob 400 years prior to God's conversation now with Moses on the mountaintop that mirrors very closely that conversation. Moses, Moses, here I am. I am the God of your fathers. The God of Abraham, 
the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And I think this exchange between God and Moses is intended to remind us that God's plans, though they have taken 400 years, they have not changed and they are not late. And we get impatient. We wonder if God has forgotten about us. I know some people this week started to wonder uh, if God has forgotten about you and your sickness. Because it just won't go away. Or maybe you're waiting for your situation to change, for things to get a little easier. Maybe we're even tempted to wonder why uh, God hasn't blessed us further as a church. Why hasn't he blessed us like he's blessed other ministries or other churches? Why aren't there more people coming to hope for addiction? Why aren't there more people getting saved? Why haven't we grown as quickly as other churches? But folks, here's the reality. Whether in our personal lives or in our corporate lives together as a church body, God moves according to his plan and according to his schedule. And he is never late and he is never too early. He always arrives precisely when he intends to. Bonus points if you can tell me afterwards what book that quote comes from. I was toss a little out for the nerds there. It may be that you've even begun to wonder, will the Lord actually return again? It's been 2,000 years since Christ died and rose again and ascended into heaven. Time can permit doubts to start creeping in, can it? Israel waited for 400 years. But in a conversation, God takes Moses back and says, the promise I made is the promise I will keep. And I am keeping it right on schedule. Folks, don't allow time to discourage you from trusting the Lord's plan and the Lord's time. The third thing that we learn from God, from this, this voice The voice of God from this bush is seen in verse number 7. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their suffering, and I have come down to deliver them. Here's the third thing that I think should be surprising to people is that God is love. He is holy, and he is always on time, but he is love, this holy God whose presence caused Moses to hide his face in fear. This God loves people. Dirty, messy, unholy, hateful, ungrateful people. He he sees, he hears, he knows, and he comes down to rescue. It's virtually a repetition of Exodus chapter 2 tells us that God saw and heard and know. Yes, I know. Siri totally thought that sees, like I was speaking to her. God has come down to rescue his people. Now, we've seen him come down in the Pentateuch before. Two other times in the book of Genesis, it says that God came down. But both times, it was for judgment. Judgment. The first was in Genesis chapter 11 when he came down to observe the tower builders. And then again in Genesis chapter 18 when he came down to observe the wickedness of Sodom and Gomorrah. It's not that he didn't know what was going on. He came down in judgment against them. But here God has come down not for judgment but for deliverance. What a surprise. Certainly this God is unlike any other God. What other God in all the world would concern himself so intimately with the affairs of man when he had nothing to gain from helping them? Right? I mean, here in just a little while, we're not going to see it today, Lord willing, next week we'll see, God is going to say, Moses, here's my name. My name is I Am. And part of the reason that God calls himself I Am is there is something in that word that tells us that God is fully self-sufficient. He needs nothing or no one. He is not lonely. He is not tired. He is not bored. He does not need your help or your money or your worship. It is not he who needs you. It is you who needs him. What other God in that condition would stoop from his holy throne 
to help people like us who don't even recognize that we need him, who do not even want to acknowledge him. We're not like him in any way. So when the Bible says that he sees you and hears your cries and understands, he knows you and remembers you, folks, we need to know that it is love that moves his heart so that he delights to save. It is his joy to rescue slaves and bring them into his family. What other God is like our God? When you compare him to any other God, it is surprising love, shocking love. He continues and says, I have come down to deliver them out of, the land of, out of the hand of the Egyptians to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk. And I think that word good, when he says good land, I think, again, there is Edenic overtones there. Remember, everything that God made was what? It was good. I'm going to take you to a good land. We're reversing Genesis. We're going back into rest, fellowship with God. A good land. Uh, it says it's flowing with milk and honey. That's not exactly terminology that we use today. I think those two terms are simply meant to say this is going to be a bountiful land. Like, like there's going to be plenty there. It, 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 there's enough pasture land to support many flocks. So there's just going to be milk everywhere. And, and, and honey and bees to pollinate your crops. Or perhaps that word honey could actually be translated sap. So again, it's, it's just it's a fruitful land. It's a land of abundance. God loves his people. Number four, God is patient. God is patient, even with those who reject him. He says, I'm going to take you to this land, the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites. And now behold the cry of the people of Israel, come to me. And I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Folks, this whole conversation about God sending Israel into a land that is not theirs to destroy the people, the inhabitants of that land, and take that land from them is really an uncomfortable conversation, isn't it? It's one of those conversations where people will use that and say, well, what kind of God is that? Like, what, what, what kind of God would ever do that? So you say God is love. That doesn't look like love, right? But part of the explanation is to take people back to the conversation that God has with Abraham in Genesis chapter 15. Because what does he say? Abraham, your people are going to go in a land that is not theirs, and they're going to be there for 400 years. But in that fourth generation, I'm going to come, and I'm going to rescue them. Why 400 years? Why the fourth generation? The explanation he gives to Abraham is this, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Which means this. God's actions against those nations were not for nothing. They had been piling up sin. Some of those sins truly despicable in, nature's, in, they, in nature, and they've been doing this for centuries. God sending Israel was an act of His judgment against those nations because they deserved judgment as a result of their own unholiness. God has treated them with more than fairness. I don't know what your definition of patience is, but, but for any of us, 400 years would have to fit. Sometimes four minutes seems like an eternity for us to be patient. That God waits with these people who had rejected him, who sin for 400 years. Then one of the most surprising parts of the story, one of the most surprising statements from this bush, verse number 10, come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Folks, it is surprising. It ought to be surprising that God uses people. It, it, it's surprising because he doesn't have to, right? I mean, God can do whatever he wants. He already said to Moses in verses 7 through 9, I have come down. I will deliver Israel. I will bring them into a land. It would have been really easy to be like, well, 
I mean, I'll follow, right? I'll come with you. But you go do it. But instead, and besides that, he could use angels. These ministering spirits that just do everything. They're, they're God's beck and call. Why not just send angels down? He doesn't. He calls Moses. Why? Two reasons. It is for our blessing and for God's glory. What a blessing for us to be used by a God who does not need us. And yet he chooses to use us anyway. I mean, it just adds another spark of surprise to his love, doesn't it? Of what benefit are we to him? I got nothing. I can run my mouth a little bit. But apart from that, he doesn't need me. He doesn't need my mouth. My talents are... N- what are they compared to him? It is our blessing. And it is then to his glory. Because look at what he chooses to use. It's us. It's also surprising that he would choose people, Moses in particular, because Moses already tried and he failed miserably. And yet God comes back and is like, let's go, Moses. So it's no wonder that Moses objects in verse number 11. Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children out of Egypt? He's like, yeah, uh, I don't know if you remember God, but I tried that once and it was a disaster. I almost lost my life. I nearly got myself killed. I ended up here in exile in the wilderness. And besides that, my best days are behind me, man. I am now 80. Which again, I get he's going to live to 120. But this is like Moses nearing retirement age for us. Moses is on the back nine. Moses is ready to shut it down and coast into retirement. My best days are behind me, God. Let's try to understand Moses here for just a little bit because I think think if we're not careful, we can be hard on Moses. That sense that his best years were behind him, it's not hard to understand that he would say, listen, God, revolutions are are for the young and the strong, right? And I am neither. And there's the pain of his past failure. That certainly, even after 40 years, would have been raw. You know those kind of failures that just stick with you? They do not go away easily. And every time the subject comes up, it's just, it's like a needle. It, It sticks. You still feel it. It's left its mark. And God comes back and says, hey Moses, you're going to go deliver Israel. And, and man, if, I mean, I don't want to sound sacrilegious here at all, but I know how I think and I know how we respond to each other. And in that situation, wouldn't it have been easy to look at someone else and go, and what's wrong with you? Like how cruel of you to even bring that up. There is nothing in me that wants to revisit that situation again. I buried that in my past. I'm done. Then there is this, I think, humility in Moses that had developed over the years where the 40-year-old Moses would have rushed into a situation with his own plan and his own strength and he would have made made a mess. 80-year-old Moses is like, who am I? Who am I? Folks, how about you this morning? Maybe, you're, maybe you can identify with being in that last quarter of life. And it's easy to sit back and assume that your years of genuinely productive service to the Lord are over. You're just like, God, i got nothing left. i got nothing beneficial left to give. And you would be wrong. Maybe your past failures have left you hesitant to try again. Like, I can't go back. I can't put myself in that position again. It's safer to stay here and let other people get involved. And you would be wrong. 
Maybe you have a real sense of your own limitations. And I, I just can't. I can't minister that way to someone. I can't love them in that way. But understand, folks, every time God calls us to do ministry, he is calling us to the impossible. I cannot fix spiritual problems. I cannot change you. I cannot deliver you from your sin. I think sometimes people look at pastors and go, man, they got it all figured out. And what you have no idea is that, that we get calls about things that are going on, and, and there is within us, like, oh no. <laughs> what do you say? You walk into situations going, I, I don't, there's no plan here. Folks, in all of this, we of all people should understand Moses' hesitation. Our typical response would be just to roll our eyes and be like, come on, man, really? I mean, it's God. It's a burning bush. As if his pain were not real. As if his questions about his own ability were not valid. There's something I feel that is right about Moses' questions here. Now, look, no bones about it. Moses is struggling with a faith issue here, and God is going to tease that out in the conversation. But I think we can pause and appreciate the suspicion that Moses has of himself. And maybe we should wonder why we are not as suspicious about ourselves when God is seeming to call us to some things. Or sometimes we rush into situations where God has not called us at all. Sometimes we look at people's giftedness and be like, oh, you should be a pastor. Or you should be in this position. And all we're doing is looking at their ability. Rather than, has God actually called them? I think maybe we would do well to be a little more surprised that God would use us. I think it would be a good sign for us, for more people to ask, who am I? You've called me to minister, so you want me to love someone? You want me to, to step across the aisle? You want me to sit down on a weekly basis and read the Bible with someone and disciple somebody? Who am I? God, I feel like I can't disciple myself, much less somebody else. Who am I? But here's where the trouble runs in. There is a legitimate question to be asked there, but the trouble is we don't often listen to God's response. Is the final surprising element. God is with us. He says to Moses, but I will be with you. I will be with you. God's answer to Moses has nothing to do with Moses. He does not try to assure Moses by pointing to his upbringing in Pharaoh's house or to his natural leadership abilities or to his higher education or to his physical strength or to all of his experience. His answer to Moses' question is, you're right, Moses, you can't do it, but that's not the issue because I'm going with you. It's the same promise he made to Jacob back in Genesis 48. I will go down with you into Egypt and I will bring you back up again. And now he is standing here with Moses saying, Moses, I'm going to go with you into Egypt and I am going to bring you back up again. Moses wants to talk about Moses. But God wants to talk about God. That's how one pastor put it. He wants to take Moses' eyes off of himself and put them on the holy God. As if he's saying that Moses, all of these surprising things that you have seen and that you have heard, that I have taught about you on this mountaintop, about who I am, they serve to you as proof that I am all you need. If I am with you, there is none who can stop you. Not even you in all your limitations and weaknesses and failures. See, it's not about God at all. This is a lesson, by the way, that I think Moses gets. It takes him a while. There's going to be some back and forth here with God. Moses is going to display a genuine lack of faith. But Moses is going to get it, and here's how I know he's going to, he gets it. 
Because later in Exodus chapter 32, you remember the whole golden calf incident? And God ultimately is like, I am not going with you into Israel, into Canaan anymore. I'm going to send my angel. And you're going to listen to him. You're going to obey him. He's going to judge you. You're going to follow him. But I am not going. And Moses essentially says, if you're not going, don't send me either. Because not even the promised land is truly desirable without your presence. God, if you go with me, I'll go. But I don't want to go anywhere without you. Moses was merely the instrument, folks. Here's what this means for us. It means your past failures do not get the last word. You can ask Paul, you can ask Peter, you can ask David. And it also means that you are not limited by your weaknesses. And these are not self-help, create your own destiny, imagine your way to victory statements. Those statements are not true because you have the power within you to manifest them. They are true because the holy God of Israel goes with you. The question is, do you have faith to believe it? Is he truly enough? And he tells Moses, listen, I'll give you a sign, Moses. You're going to lead Israel back to this mountain, and you're going to worship me with all of Israel back on this mountain. You go, wait a second. <laughs> what? That's not much of a sign, right? Because... Because usually we think of signs as something that happens ahead of time so that God is proving to us that we can trust him. Like, remember, like, like the fleece in Gideon, like make this thing wet or dry so I know that I can move forward in obedience. God's like, no, that's not how this is going to work. I'm going to give you a sign, and the sign is going to be you're going to come back to this mountain, and you're going to worship me, and you're going to remember that I have been with you, and I did everything I said I was going to do. But you've got to step out in faith and trust. You've got to believe that I am sufficient for you. Let's pray, Lord. It's so easy for us to forget that you are with us. It's so easy for us to lose sight of your holiness. So often our vision is consumed, it is dominated by our troubles and if not our troubles, then the temporary pleasures of life. Lord, on top of that, even when we do remember that you are with us, we are reminded in some way, either through your word, the fellowship of your people, your song. We sometimes doubt as to whether or not you will be sufficient. We often feel deep down that we need something more in order to truly be successful. We feel unworthy, unequipped. And Lord, through all of these things, it is evidence that we often have our eyes more on ourselves than we have them on you. So God, take the eyes of your people this morning. Fix them on the throne of your holiness. Humble us and embolden us at the same time. And God, may those who are still lost in their sin, who have yet, who have yet to meet you, who have yet to submit to your voice, to truly know what it is to be loved by a holy God, who knows everything there is to know about us and yet chooses to love us anyway. Lord, for those people this morning, I pray that you would speak in a compelling way. I pray that you would call them according to your irresistible grace and make them yours. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.